if anyone was thinking of building a Facebook group, the things that I've learned about that is that I learn a lot about the audience there and it's not perhaps what you think. And you have to be really precise about um, what your objectives are because this Facebook group is very useful to me in terms of research. But I'd have to say, actually, for the tours that we're offering, it may not be the best audience because a lot of these people in this Facebook group, 95,000 people, they ask, um, they want quick answers to quick questions. There's not a lot of in-depth conversation going along. So they go, what's the best tour in Rome? And I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, <laughs> well, what are you interested in? What do you want to do? And, you know, what is your passions and all of that but you know a lot of people just want to have you know someone and, and in fact it's quite bizarre someone that they don't know and they don't know whose experience recommends something just for them so in actual fact what this has been very useful for for me is my relationship with day tour operators so I have a very strong relationship with several day tour operators that work in Italy in the major cities, Rome, Florence, Venice, and down on the Amalfi Coast as well. And um, so I'm able to recommend those partners to this audience. And that's how, from a revenue perspective, I've you know built up a really strong revenue of affiliate sales. Welcome back to another episode of the Tourpreneur Podcast, where we scour the world for interesting, fascinating, intelligent, witty tour operators to share their stories and their insights with our community. And boy, today we have a phenomenal guest. We have Katie Clark from Untold Italy. And Katie is here from Australia and is going to tell us about her multi-day Italian tour business that she started. Welcome, Katie. How are you? Oh, thanks so much for having me, Mitch. I'm really excited to be on the show. I'm an avid listener and I love all the content that you produce. So I'm really thrilled that you invited me on to be part of it. Thank you. Katie, let's dive into your business right away. First of all, nobody wakes up, is born and becomes a tour operator. We all have interesting backstories. What life path, life crisis brought you into <laughs> tour operating? Oh, well, it's a bit of a long story, but I'll try to make it fairly short. So I'd always been fascinated by travel. And I think I got that from my mum, actually, who for some reason, she's in her 70s now, but when she was at university, she studied Indonesian and Japanese, which was not the thing to do in the 1960s in Australia. <laughs> so she took us on many adventures when we were kids and it did open up my eyes to the whole world. And um, I left home when I was 18 from Australia, which um, back then it was a pretty, it was like a big country town and headed off to Europe and just had my mind blown really. And um, yeah, so I'd always loved travel, but, uh, and I'd always wanted to be a writer, but I had uh, exited university in the nineties when there wasn't a lot of jobs around. (laughs) So I took whatever was available and I ended up um, in IT, which Um, actually gave me a lot of opportunities to travel the world and um, have some incredible experiences as part of that. But it was never my passion. And I think the thing I liked most about it was the actual travel. And I would do anything to get on a plane and go to wherever they were having a conference or (laughs) whatever exciting new destination they were launching a product in. So uh, it was always in my blood. And then we moved to London and shortly after my children, I put twins, uh, were born. It was a, like kind of a little bit of a crazy move. But um, the condition of it was, I said to my husband, who'd always wanted to work in the UK, well, I'm going to be traveling and we're all going to be traveling. So that's good. And so from that spawn, I know I didn't want to go back to my corporate job. And so I started writing and creating content and I started um a travel blog, which was focused on family and food related travel, which are really my passions. And from there, that kind of just evolved. And I really wanted to make it my, you know, income and to sort of really switch careers and follow my dreams. And so I did that and I was, I built um, that blog up and then I decided to focus on Italy because my husband's family um, is Italian and I've always loved traveling in Italy. And we spent a lot, a lot of time there in sort of the 2015 to 2017. So I felt like I had a lot to offer people in the way of um, sharing information. 
Anyway, so then I started this website and a Facebook group and I would just kind of snowballed from there and then at the start of 2020 I launched a podcast which is called Untold Italy and it's all about the stories of the hidden stories of Italy not just the highlights but also delving deep into some of the regions that people don't really know about and for some crazy reason I just kept going throughout the pandemic (laughs) like just couldn't stop and I yeah I just released an episode every week and from there it's you know snowballed into something that's quite big and exciting and yeah since the you know everyone started traveling again it's just been amazing everything's grown my website's grown my Facebook group and the um the podcast so I'm not one to sit still so how did I end up in tours well I really felt like the experiences that I loved the most about having in Italy were not uh, standing in line for the Colosseum and not, uh, you know, not being squashed up against the wall in the Vatican museums. But it was really, you know, getting connected with people out in the countryside and um, and different places, the lesser known cities and towns. And I really just wanted to help other people have those amazing experiences where you do have that connection with that incredible Italian hospitality the food, the wine, and the cultural experiences that you just don't get when you're kind of in the bigger cities um, in your standard experience. So um, I like to challenge, and I and I did have an, a background in events management from when I was working in IT, and I loved crafting sort of really interesting experiences. So it seemed like a good fit. So. And somehow everything came together and I we launched our tours last year and in Puglia and Dort Piedmont. They actually took place a few weeks ago. Uh, they were our first tours. So we're very, very, very new <laughs> and um, we've got a lot to learn. And it's been great being part of the tourpreneur community because there's so many people with so much more experience than I have in this area and I'm just loving learning everything from everyone. So that's Fantastic. That was a great short sort of rundown of the fact that, A, you have a fantastic variety of experience in marketing, in IT, in writing, in all of the areas that a tour operator needs to help make uh, a connection with their customers. But more than that, you did something that is the envy of many tour operators. You created an audience just salivating for the experiences that you're creating namely the podcast and the Facebook group. Let's start with the Facebook group because I'm I'm going to I'm an American, all right? I need you to toot your horn. Talk to me about the size and the growth of this Facebook group and what it what it what it what it's been creating this this beast. <laughs> it is it is really a beast actually. Uh, so it some um, started that one in I think 2018 and it's um now at 95,000 members, which is quite crazy and the engagement on it is really great too it's 85 um, percent engagement which I find quite interesting because you think that a lot of people would drop off after they've had their trips but I think the thing about Italy is that people do a lot of repeat trips to Italy so I uh, that's a massive advantage that I have is that once they get a little bit of a taste of um, the Italian lifestyle they want to go back and try but um if anyone was thinking of building a Facebook group, the things that I've learned about that is that I learn a lot about the audience there and it's not perhaps what you think. And you have to be really precise about um, what your objectives are because this Facebook group is very useful to me in terms of research. But I'd have to say, actually, for the tours that we're offering, it may not be the best audience because a lot of these people in this Facebook group, 95,000 people, they ask, um, they want quick answers to quick questions. There's not a lot of in-depth conversation going along. So they go, what's the best tour in Rome? And I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, <laughs> well, what are you interested in? What do you want to do? And, you know, what is your passions and all of that? But, you know, a lot of people just want to have, you know, someone, and, and in fact, it's quite bizarre, someone that they don't know. And they don't know whose experience recommends something just for them. So in actual fact, what this has been very useful for, for me, is my relationship with day tour operators. So I have a very strong relationship with several day tour operators that 
work in Italy in the major cities, Rome, Florence, Venice, and down on the Amalfi Coast as well. And um, so I'm able to recommend those partners to this audience. And that's how, from a revenue perspective, I've you know built up a really strong revenue of affiliate sales and also advertising and sponsorship. So uh, I'm always happy to work with anyone who's got a really great offer in that area. If you're a day tour operator in Italy and you've got something unique, uh, yeah, it's a, been a really fantastic way to um, partner with um, these operators. And we actually are partnering with them as part of the tours as well, because we've got such a strong collaboration going that it makes sense to um, partner with them. This is really interesting. So let's break down a few things that you said. Number one, that Facebook group isn't exactly the Untold Italy customer. In other words, they are, are you getting many conversions of your tours from there? Or do you almost see it as a separate business? In other words, it's more the affiliate relationships, the affiliate deals that you're doing with the day tour operators in the group. Yeah, I would say the bulk of the people are in there. It will be um, day tour operators um, would, would be the main market for them because people are just looking for that quick answer. They don't really want um, an in-depth discussion about <laughs> yeah. whether they should go to Luca or Pisa or something like that. They just want a quick yeah. answer. Um, so what I have got from that group, there's a lot of intelligence that I've got out of that group, like market research. Uh, and I also create a lot of articles to answer those questions because apart from being sick of answering the same questions over and over again, that drives people to my websites, but there are people lurking. They're not usually the people that ask the questions. So it's sometimes hard to know exactly who, what's going on? Because I know I do get email messages from people saying, "Oh, your group's fantastic," and I got a lot of information. So it's difficult to know. But the the noisy people are the ones that, um, you know, like it's very quick to say, "Oh, here, these are the you want to book your Coliseum tour. These are the operators we recommend." What uh, does selling look like for you in that group? Are you posting your tours, or are you keeping it completely, almost, you know, agnostic? I'm open to everybody's opinions. This is just for the community. Yeah, it's it's a really good question because finding that balance uh, between, uh, you know, letting people um, give their points of view uh, and, you know, protecting my business assets is quite um, interesting. However, I mean, I'm like mostly open to everyone's opinion as long as they don't just go, I like, <laughs> you know, you need to actually say why you like it because uh, I think otherwise what's it becomes a little bit of a advertising and um, it's very interesting because uh, and I think if people are interested in using Facebook groups as a marketing tool I'm um, very uh, friendly and collaborate well with people that operate in different countries that have just similar Facebook groups to mine and one thing that is a big no-no is to go and self-promote in those groups we know what you're doing <laughs> and you just get booted without any, you know, and so you lose the channel where you might have reached out to the owner and said, hey, I'm really interested in accessing your audience. What do you think? Can we work together and collaborate? And most of us will go, yeah, we'd love to. Yeah. How, what, how can we work together? So, yeah, just be very mindful that um, self-promotion is not well regarded <laughs> by group owners and it doesn't work, you know. You can do it once or twice and you might get a few click throughs and you may even get a sale, but it's not a long-term business proposition. I can't stress that advice enough as also a group owner. The tourpreneur group is not 95,000 people. I would not be here. I'd probably be in a coffin if I had to try to wrangle 95,000 tour <laughs> operators. 5,000 is enough. But what yeah. what's, what strikes me is is people who don't just drop a DM to the moderators first and introduce themselves, say what you're up to, who you are, because actually we're we're very keen to promote good quality value-based content to the community. And it, it, it means so much more also when we share a link than when you're doing it as the group member, especially a commercial group member. And often all that, all we, all we ask is just that you just come to us and we say, oh yeah, this looks interesting. We review it and then we post it. It's not anything more than that. Yeah. I think it's really, it's just, well, it's manners. 
<laughs> it is, but you know what's funny? It just goes back to this um, hobby horse of mine and Peter's and Chris's, which is uh, a little, I mean, I, I feel so old saying this, but we've like lost to the art of the human relationship building part of what business development is. We think it's often just a digital marketing problem or you just join the groups and you spam or there's 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 a lot of these things that have removed the people and people uh, probably find that easier, but it's just so less effective than doing that hard work of making those relationships. Absolutely. And so one of the things that I always um, have um, iterated with my moderation team, and I actually have a paid team managing that group now because I can't emotionally or <laughs> physically do it anymore, but is that we always say, hi, whoever, instead of just going, well, the best Coliseum tour is, you know, because it just adds that well, you, you become a person then. And, you know, I'm I, I'm sure everyone gets this um, in their businesses, but I'm constantly shocked at the number of people that just email me and go, I need a hotel in Rome on these dates. <laughs> yep. What? You know, it's really, I'm a person, you know, and there's <laughs> always a person behind an email address, you know, it's not a bot. And even if there was a bot, I'm sure they'd love to be spoken to in a charming way. <laughs> That's going to be the episode title. I'm a person, exclamation mark. <laughs> so, you know, that's this has been really interesting uh, uh, talking about Facebook groups. I also want to talk about your podcast. What what has that done for your business? Because it's also something that we, we hear often from operators thinking about, I guess I would maybe would call it an alternative, quote unquote, uh, channel for marketing or for connecting with an audience. What has what has that done for your tour business? Oh, that's done everything. It's my passion. I love the podcast. It's been a way throughout the pandemic to connect with people in Italy and keep people's travel dreams alive. And I continually get messages saying thank you for doing that because, you know, as I was on my isolated walk around a lake and or going for a bike ride. I had you and your guests in my ear talking about Italy and I love to go. I just was kept dreaming of going back there. So having those messages from my listeners has just been amazing. But also I, I, what I do is feature other people on my podcast. So I do interviews mm -hmm. and they're mainly tour guides and, um, or, you know, That's people that I know it's very useful. So I've made some excellent partnerships from that already. In fact, you know, a lot of these people are designing and building tours for me uh, at the moment and will lead them. And they are, they are absolutely true, true experts in their area. And I couldn't ask for people with more passion and more experience to be part of my team. It's really been delightful. And the way that kind of snowballed was, uh, you know, had some people on the show uh, that, you know, like if, I think if you're a tour guide and you can speak English and you can get your passion across on a podcast, well, it's like the ultimate marketing uh, for a tour guide. So if you're a tour guide, try and get on podcast because you will make sales, no doubt about it. So I have like, even just today, I just had another email from one of the guides that's been on my show saying, Katie, I can't tell you how many um, tours have been booked and people have said, oh, you know, I was on the Untold Italy show. You, I heard you there and I wanted, just wanted to join your tour after listening to your voice because with a podcast, you might have half an hour to 45 minutes and you can build a relationship very easily in that time. And people think that they know you. I know this because they come and tell me, <laughs> um, but they think they know you. And so, you know, as a tour guide, I mean, that you're a storyteller naturally and you've got all those, um, amazing skills and they can really come out on a podcast without it being like a scary video situation uh, because in my podcast we do uh, like a video recording but we don't do I don't publish the video maybe I should but <laughs> I find a lot of the Italian houses are very dark and dingy <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I love lurking in European homes I love to see the yeah. backgrounds of my podcast guests I'm looking at what books are in the screen of your your room right now as well yeah <laughs> oh yeah it's it's always good to be a little bit nosy I think uh, you can always find out a few little secrets but th that's been really the most amazing thing is the partnerships and collaborations that I've built through the podcast and you know I don't I doubt that I would have started the tours without those connections to be honest because 
I don't, I mean, here I am in Australia running tours in Italy. I mean, and my audience is like 80% in America. So <laughs> I'm truly global business. But, you know, obviously I need, you know, feet and hands and minds on the ground to make my business run. Yeah, I, I'm so impressed with how you flipped the script. Everyone's always struggling to find new partners and hire guides or find guides. And you've really just, you just have them coming to you, basically. They're coming to your group, coming to your podcast, and actually you're providing value for them as well. You're providing them a platform and an audience, and you can almost audition the good ones and then use them to build your particularly good tours. I mean, that's brilliant. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd like to say I did it on purpose, but <laughs> it didn't really. It sort of happened by osmosis and it was a really good learning experience, you know. But I mean, I think it's a, another way that if you are, you are, you know, wanting to build your business is to find these podcasts. Now, to be honest, there aren't that many travel podcasts and it doesn't actually have its own category on Apple, which I think is actually outrageous because there are some great ones out there. Uh, particularly ones that are destination focused. Like I just, there's actually not that many out there. So I think, you know, if anyone was thinking about doing it, they could have a nosy around and see what's out there because I, I think there's definitely a market for it. I mean, I've had 1 million listens, so it can't be, <laughs> must be something doing something right. So mm. yeah, I think there's an opportunity for sure, but it is a lot of work. Um, please don't think that. <laughs> something you just turn up and turn the mic on and go for it it's definitely it's a lot of work yeah yeah uh you're right i think it's an underdeveloped opportunity uh to get mm. your message out there and it's one also that is all about providing value and i think that's the best way to market especially in today's kind of saturated sales climate it's a it's a space where we still listen to real voices uh, we get hear, we get to hear storytellers, and it's an opportunity to just show up for an audience. I mean, it's what we do with Tourpreneur, and every single day we get people thanking us just for being there, uh, for making a difference in their lives by showing up with their voice. And you're right, a s segment of them, a small group of them are going to become your customers, but it's it's a virtuous funnel because at the, at, at the top of the funnel, you're just providing a lot of good stuff for, for a lot of people out there. And that snowballs, you've used that word snowball a couple of times. It's not automatic. It's not like running a Facebook ads campaign where within a couple of weeks, suddenly you're generating all these leads. It's something that builds up over time. But when it does reach, I don't know, that critical mass, it does just start to take on a life of its own. I don't know if you found that. Uh, definitely. And I think, uh, like I said, I didn't really do it by osmosis. I got, I like deliberately just sort of organically happened. I was adding in different platforms and gradually building up a brand. And at the same time I was building up my brand perspective. So, you know, it's, it's always evolving every day. You know, I tweak it a little bit here or there just based on the feedback and what I'm learning. And yeah, I think that if you, um, the, the main thing to do in this case is, and I think the thing that I did right was focus on one thing at a time. So once I got the Facebook group cranking along, then I moved on to the podcast <laughs> and then I moved on to the tours because if you can't do everything at, at once, you can't, you'll just sort of collapse. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people that likes to think that I can do everything, but you yeah. just simply can't do it well. <laughs> Well, what I've, yeah, exactly. What I've learned is the quality isn't there and it takes a lot of just showing up and that it's that persistence and that, that it's that, it's that, it's that, um, regularity that actually makes the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Consistency is everything. And I think, you don't know, like, I mean, I'm just kind of like, I don't know why I've chosen to do my podcast weekly, but I have, I might, I'm thinking of pulling it back a little bit next year, but we'll see how we go. I've got so many topic ideas. It's not funny. Uh, but you know, I think consistency, even if you do it every, say, every two weeks or even once a month, or, you know, like you just need to be consistent, actually. And it's and that it does make the big difference. So I want to shift the focus a little bit. You had mentioned affiliate relationships and I wanted to dial in just a little bit more technically about how you're working with selling affiliate tours. Are you selling hotels and other travel components as well. You have this massive audience that doesn't exactly want your tours per se, but they are booking and buying something. 
And so how how are you how how have you set up that sort of business proposition within your Facebook group or within your sort of business structure in general? Yeah, it's I love affiliate marketing. It's so much fun um, because you get all the glory, you get all the revenue. <laughs> you don't have to, you do actually do have to do a bit of hard work, but it's um, you get to work with some pretty clever people, and um, you can really make some really nice revenue with high margin on as part of that. So um, that's from my side, but also from the from the affiliate side, they get to reach my audience. And it's a win-win situation. So if you've got a, you know, like, for example, I don't know if I can mention who I work with. Yeah. But okay. Oh, my yeah, gosh. No, on Tourpreneur, we name names. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> um, so I work um, primarily on the tours um, side of things, day tours in Italy. I work with uh, take walks and live tours. And the reason why I work with them is they're highly professional and it's a really, you know, uh, open transparent relationship so I can see exactly what's happening so how it works is um that they will say they've got a tour that they want to promote um say it's a food tour let's just say for argument's sake they will have a link and if someone clicks on that link and then they go ahead and buy that tour then I get a percentage of the sale so uh so usually it's between 10 and 15 percent and uh i do very, very well out of that um, on the content side of my business. I will say that it's volume based. So you're probably looking at about a 5% conversion. That's a good conversion on those um, type of things. So you need to get quite a bit of traffic to build it up. But again, it's the snowball effect. <laughs> you know, once you start recommending things in the group, then people go, oh, I mean, like I see it now, like someone just asked um, in the Facebook group before, oh, which, which tour should I do of um, the Vatican museums? And someone, they all just said live tours because that's what I recommend. It's so funny because you can see people, you know, like taking that recommendation on board and it takes a few um, months to build up to that, but then it just kind of just keeps going. Uh, the other, I think, a really important thing I want to mention though as well is my website is the backbone of everything. So Untold Italy is two parts. I've got a tours website and I've also got a content website, which is basically a blog and it's got over 200 articles on it, but they're written to SEO principles and I rank number one for many, many, many keywords. Uh, and that is really where a lot of the conversions come from because it's people searching, ooh, what's the best tour in Rome? Because I've got an article for that. <laughs> it's like so and you know people will go and they'll click 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 and then they buy and then they get a percentage which is very nice so that sounds very nice are you also doing that with lodging with like booking.com affiliates or anything like that or is it primarily just through day tours day tours lodging booking.com is probably my biggest affiliate um and it's been actually really helpful for the tours which i can talk a bit about later I also have insurance, uh, transport, um, rental cars, um, what else? Ferries, Amazon for guidebooks, plans, trains, anything. automobiles, everything. yeah, luggage. <laughs> Wait a minute. Anything to do with travel? I'm, I've got it. <laughs> That's great, Katie. Essentially, what you're telling me is that you're an influencer. I mean, this is classic influencer marketing. That. Your your or, or content marketing, your your influencing in your podcast, the the word, unfortunately, no longer. I guess my point in bringing up that word is that it no longer conveys the richness and the complexity and the, dare I say, elegance of the relationships that uh that 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 you have now. I think I think the word sometimes gets gets associated pejoratively in people's heads with the idea of a person in a hat. Um, who's there just to take photos in front of a beautiful beach, uh, the Instagram hat. I live on a street filled with Instagram hats. Uh, <laughs> but in but in fact, what it is is building an audience that trusts your voice. Uh, in this case, it's your opinions, not necessarily your hat and your clothing style, but they trust you. They follow you. They're there for you through SEO, through, through multi-channel marketing. I mean, multi-channel content marketing, a podcast, a Facebook group, a website. And from there... Uh, they trust you enough to click on the things that you tell them to click and they appreciate the recommendations and you'll earn a little chunk off of that. Yeah. And I think it's a completely new model. <laughs> like it's not yeah. anything, it's not something that's, that's 
like been around for a long time. This has just grown and grown and grown. And like I said, I've, there's, I've, if people are operating different uh, markets, then I can definitely put you in touch with people that do similar things to what I do. Uh, but it's not, it's not something that's been around for ages and it's not instant. But the, the thing that I really need to be careful of is I don't want it to be about me. I'm not interested in it being about me. I get a little bit embarrassed when people come up to me and say, oh, are you Katie from Totally And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want it to be a personality-based uh, business. I want it to be based on Italy and the things that I really care about. So because as well, like, if something happens to me, then where's the business? It's not, there's nothing. And so my goal is to really give people the best information that they can about planning their trip to Italy and so they can have an incredible time. And so that's for me is a legacy that I can leave rather than if it's just all about me. Uh, it sort of, well, it's, you know, you have to keep going on like an energizer bunny, just trying to, <laughs> you know, to, yeah. to keep the content coming. And uh, for me, it's, it's more important that it's, um, that it's that it's it's more of a brand based activity. So let's talk about your brand because I actually have a question at at the front of my mind because it's a question that is often posed by entrepreneurs in the community. You run untold Italy, the things that I'm assuming are not told. The <laughs> problem is everybody wants the told things. They they want the things that they think they want and selling. I know so many operators who struggle with selling the off the beaten path, the different, the, you know, any of those cliches, you know, they're better, but getting your customer to understand that is, 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 is the mountain that a lot of people die on as they try to climb it. So I'm interested in what your experience has been developing a brand that is specifically about, I'm guessing the kinds of Italian experiences that are not the ones that you find, uh, skip the line Coliseum tickets, et cetera, et cetera. What's it been like developing that brand and then getting customers to jump on board? Oh, well, let's just say I'm still on the mountain. <laughs> 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 but um, it's not easy. It's not easy. And, you know, like for everyone that's trying to do that, I'm with you. Like this is, this, there's a lot of motivations for it. But number one, just from a sustainability perspective and just from, you know, everyone enjoying themselves and not being squashed and, ripped off and all of those things that happen when you're in an over-touristed environment. Like we know why we want to do it, but it's just like, why can't people see? <laughs> so, I mean, just this uh, weekend I was with my family and I'm helping them organize a trip. And it was so funny because I just couldn't stop laughing because they were saying, I said, so now what are you guys going to do in Paris? And they say, oh, we just want to go to the Louvre and see how Mona Lisa. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you know, and they know my, what I do and they know, and they trust me, but I think, um, you have to go on your own journey and it's really easy to sort of tell people what they need to do, but you've got to show them. And I think that's the, the key to it all. So, you know, like, um, for the tours we've invested in, um, this amazing young woman photographer, she's from, she's actually from Perth in Australia, but she lives in Milan and she speaks fluent Italian, but she takes amazing photos. And I can tell you right now that that's what's flipping the switch because people are very visual. Um, even though the podcast is helpful, uh, I think that once they see these photos that we've got, they're going to, they just, the, the switch completely flips. And they say, oh, oh, I didn't, oh, that looks very beautiful. Or maybe I want to go check that out, you know. So uh, I think the visuals are really important. Uh, and also um, I had a really great chat about this with Peter last week about how to um, connect the off the beaten path to the standard stuff. And you have to, you have to sort of give them an option. So, for example, with our tours, we're doing... Um, so we've got some new ones um, coming, but always with our tours, their multi-day tours, we're actually making them start and end in a, in a city that's got a train station that's very easily accessible from the major hubs in Italy, so Rome or Florence or Venice. So they can just go to the train station and start and end their tour there. So we're making it really easy. Uh, and then we're also... Um, we've also just started up some city-based tours, which we just launched this week and have had a, a flurry of inquiries. And so it's very interesting, you know, people, 
will always be going to Rome. And so, you know, I really didn't, I didn't want to, to do a Rome tour, but now I'm really excited about what we've got planned for Rome. I think it's really different and interesting. So I'm really excited about it. So talk to me about, I know you and I both share sort of a love. Uh, we get excited about designing experiences. We love the design process, the research, the the creativity that goes into it. So you've launched an untold Rome, uh, an experience of a Rome a little different. What does that mean for you? What what are what are some of the things you thought about in the design process to create a city experience that differentiates itself from um, from the normal? Yeah, so I, I've had a few um, longer chats with Mitch. I've been lucky to have. Um, one of the coaching calls. I think we were the only two because she's a so. because she's a tourpreneur plus member. May I might may, oh, may I that, yeah okay that's true that, yeah. That's uh, but, yeah. access to Mitch. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. I'll, I'll be going for that. <laughs> Semi adulterated, excuse me. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, like to me, I've always been an independent traveler. You know, from a very young age, and you know, like I think in the nineties, if anyone travelled in the nineties with their backpack around Europe, I know you're out there. I know you were the ones that were rocking up at the train station, waiting for those accommodation cards, thinking, "Oh, we weren't even thinking if we were risking our lives back then." But <laughs> we're all still here. <laughs> we're all still here. <laughs> we're all still here, exactly. But I think you know what was great. <laughs> You ask me about um, yeah, designing Rome, the, the design city Rome. experience that that goes somewhere else. Like, what was your process in terms of what do you include? What are you finding? How are you making Rome special? Yeah, well, I, Rome has a thousand stories or a million stories. It's built on people. It's built on you know, like the stories, the intrigues, the drama. It's like two thousand years of you know. Netflix gold, I reckon. So you can just, there's so many things to, to peel away the layers and just dig deep into what's happening. And I think, you know, cities, cities that are great. And I don't, I don't think anyone could argue that Rome's not a great city because it's, you know, so many things, you know, have evolved from whatever has happened in Rome have really, um, they it's all about the people and who they were and, you know, what they, the decisions they made and how they went about you know, crafting the city and, or, you know, like, you know, who was going to be the next Caesar. And there's just so many stories out there that you just do and to be, not to be cheeky, but they do remain untold. And so there's so many fascinating stories about, I mean, Anthony and Cleopatra is just such an incredible story. This is like this queen from Egypt and she was living in Rome and then she went off and there was sea battles. I mean, you can't, I mean, why why do you want to just stand and look at a painting when you can hear this story about these incredible people that shaped our future and our past, you know, everything that's gone before us, you know, I just think it's so incredible. So everything that we're doing, and this did take, um, you know, inspired a lot by, you know, some recent tours that I did when I was in Rome, but also a conversation with Mitch. And he also put me onto a really great podcast by your friend, Art, what's it called? Oh yeah, the art engager, uh, Claire Brown, absolutely amazing. Highly yeah. recommend, love Claire. Yeah, it's really a brilliant podcast, just to get your juices, creative juices flowing. And so for me, you know, like with our Rome tour, it's not just about those stories, but it's linking them to other aspects of the modern city. So, for example, we wanted to go to visit this palazzo, and then we're getting some cocktails designed around some of the protagonists of this palazzo, and. You know, like, so if it's like, you know, a very fancy duchess who's got a little bit of intrigue and might be a little bit of a spicy cocktail, you know, those type of things just adds that little bit of extra flavor and um, just creates a mystery and drama that I think, you know, everyone appreciates. I love that. And it's so simple. Adding a story to a moment, a drink, a meal, a hotel, whatever it is, gives the client something to go home and share much more than just the best martini or the best cocktail they ever had, but something that they can go home and means a little bit more. And I, I remember back in my days as a trip leader, I used to do this with song requests because everybody always wanted to listen 
to music. And so you pass around, this was tried and true. Everybody would pass around a clipboard and, you know, they'd write down the songs that they wanted. And then, you know, you'd, you'd play the songs, but I created something called a song and a story. And the idea was very simple. It was if the, if the customer uh, wrote a song down on a clipboard, they also uh, needed to know that when I played that song, they were responsible for sharing the story behind the song. And I would play the song and then we would listen to the customer, the traveler say, that was the song that played on my first wife's uh, uh, radio in the background when we kissed in her bedroom <laughs> after I sneaked into her window at night and we were afraid her parents were going to come in at any moment and it was the most magical night of my life. Whatever. I'm making that up, obviously, but the idea was that song was way more interesting and at the end of the trip every single guest shared a special moment a nostalgic moment of their life and we all bonded and connected over those moments and remembered them and attached them to the songs that we heard all it's doing is just adding that perceived value through like you said the richness that you're literally standing on as you walk the streets or or, or yeah explore these neighborhoods when you were just um, talking there, Mitch, what I did also spring to mind is the different senses that you can bring into anything, even your just daily lives. But what makes it like, I think, a tour experience more special is, you know, all those, you know, we've got five senses. Do we use them all, you know? And I think that that's a really important thing for me to build into our tours. So the, the taste, smell, sight, the sounds and you know, if you can weave a lot of those things in and connect them back to people's memories, then that really is very powerful. I will be borrowing that um, song idea. That sounds really great. We did it's great. I, I recommend it to everybody because it just bonds a little group. You know, everybody feels closer to each other. And sometimes we forget that it's not just about us as the experience giver and the guests as the passive receivers of everything we've choreographed. It's just about gathering and connection and community and that facilitation in some ways is the best thing that we can do, creating lifelong friendships and memories. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we, we actually did something similar on our Sicily trip this year when I, I I'm always curious about what is the first um, concert people went to. And there's always a great story behind that as well. Mine's not so great. Mine's a bit boring because my parents took me to see John Denver. <laughs> But, you know, I maybe connect with one of the guests who just absolutely loved John Denver and, you know, that was his um, his first one as well. And then his wife, actually, this was great. She Her first one was a Grateful Dead, which I thought was epic. Loved it. That's amazing. I mean, my first concert was probably the lamest thing ever. I don't know if you remember this guy. It was, again, my parents dragged me to it. It was Yanni. Do you remember the Greek keyboard pianist player from the 90s? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Long flowing logs, Yanni live at the Acropolis. Oh my god, I was so I was so dorky back then. Uh. <laughs> well, it's I'll probably inspired a world of great travels for you, which is yeah, you know, you do you never know where your life's gonna take you. And I just love these, you know, picking these moments and having them sparked again because people will maybe not even think about that. Um you know, and one thing that's always stayed with me actually it was when I was in my twenties and I did like to party pretty hard. Um, you know, where well, there was one day when I sat back and I thought, what are the top five nights of my life? And, you know, none of these partying, you know, weekends were actually featuring very highly in that. <laughs> so it's actually a really good exercise to do just to think, what, what was it? What, what were the things that happened on that top five nights of your life that hey, made it really special? I've just thought of another game. So you have all of your guests write down one of the top five nights of their life and you put it in a box and then you read them to the guests and we all have to guess which guest had that night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because people do change. So, you know, maybe you're outside. They do. They do. <laughs> you might see the most boring old person and not realize that they went to the Grateful Dead. So <laughs> not not that you're boring or old. Um so speaking of boring, I do want to finish with something that you had brought up, which I know is another big pain point of our community. And so I don't want to gloss over it. And it's SEO. It's the fact that you've created kind of, it sounds like a, a content marketing behemoth through organic uh, search. And 
what was your journey in discovering and understanding what SEO strategy was going to work for your multi-day business? Well, I'm a bit of a nerd in that regard. So, and I like, I'm a bit competitive as well. I really like to, to win. And if, with Google, it's, um, there is definitely a formula, but what I would say is, look, you have to pick your battles. And if, I, I mean, I've created a lot of content now. I have a team that creates the content and we know what works. Um, but it's, it's a big investment. It's huge. Like you need to know the on-page SEO. You need to know how to write for SEO. You need to, uh, know all of the social media aspects of how you set up your meta tags and all of that. For most people that are starting out, it's too much, you know, like I just, I think there's different ways to market. You've got to choose the right marketing angle for you. For me, I'm really lucky that I learned it and I learned it from someone that is like actually a genius in this area and it's always changing. So you've got to stay on top of it as well. So unless you're prepared yeah. to really invest your time in doing that, I think it's really, um, SEO is difficult and I don't want to tread on anyone's toes, but I, I really feel like if anyone's promising you're going to get to number one ranking on Google and you're going to get a ton of traffic, I don't, I just don't think it's, I know how to do it. <laughs> and it's, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm ranking one, but I'm still not getting the traffic. So you've got to start tweaking a lot of the things. So unless you're prepared to spend a lot of time and energy, and I would say the equivalent of a university degree is how much time I've spent learning it. Um, it's not worth it. So Hi, you, know, you <laughs> yeah, just, um, if I, there's different ways you can market your business, you know, and you know, I think, you know, it, I think people are just always shouting the new best thing. Oh, you've got to do SEO. Or you've got to do Instagram or you've got to do TikTok. I've got to do just choose one thing and do it really well, I think. And, and then once you've mastered that, move on to the next thing, because otherwise you're going to be running yourself ragged and to what end result, I don't know. I want to finish with uh, one final question to you. And it's simply this, you've built a business that sound, it sounds like it really thrives on great partnerships, great relationships. And I'm wondering if you have any final sort of parting words of advice for how to go about creating those strategically that work for a business. What, what have you learned about partnership building to, to sort of power your multi-day business? Oh, thanks for asking that, Mitchell. It's really important to me that I partner and collaborate with people. And in fact, my business wouldn't operate, you know, here from Australia down at the very bottom of the earth without some really strong partnerships. And, you know, my dad brought me up and he, he's only ever taught me he's the main thing. He says, you've got to be upfront and honest and, you know, direct in your dealings and don't set expectations that you can't meet. And so uh, that's the way I always like to engage with people. And if I... I kind of get a bit nervous if I can't deliver. <laughs> and sometimes, uh, you know, like I'm also someone that says yes to a lot of things, but I need to learn to say no to more things just because I really want to make sure those relationships that I have, I nurture them and I make sure that, you know, I'm checking in with these people and, you know, um, just truly collaborating. It's interesting. I don't know if it's an Italian thing, but the word collaboration <laughs> is... I'm finding it means maybe it's somewhere like a one-way street, but collaboration is actually, you know, a little bit of give and take here, you know. So an example is some of our day tour operators. I had an amazing tour with one of their guides and she was asking me what I was doing because she knew about the partnership and what have you. And she said, oh, I would just so love to be part of that, Katie. It really sounds amazing. And I said, well, you know, I don't really want to tread on your boss's toes, you know, because I, I, I just don't want to go there, you know? So you're still always respecting the relationship and you know what, that situation has worked out really, really well because now I spoken to her manager and she said, Oh yeah, no, you go for it. You know, she really wanted to, um, support that separate relationship because she knew that would be a benefit to her team member. So it just, you know, if you're, up front, you're not doing anything sneaky and, and if people maybe not even do it deliberately, but it's just sort of like, oh, that's a great idea. I might go ahead and look into that, but just pause and think, well, how, who's, who are we going to be working with? How can we do something together? Because if you do it together, it's going to be stronger and probably better than if you try and go it alone. 
words to live by. Great, more, than, more, more than just a tour of business, I think that's a great uh, note to end on, especially in this sort of post-COVID world where we're all looking for better, stronger uh, relationships and connections. And Katie Clark, I'm glad you're connected to our community. I am deeply appreciative of you and your insights. Thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Mitch, thanks for having me and thanks so much for um, starting Toolpreneur. It's just been an absolute lifeline for me and my team. We love being part of it. How do we discover your podcast, your Facebook group and everything else? Well, uh, you can just Google Untold Italy. So Untold in Italy and then it'll take you to our main site where you, you can find the podcast. That's also on Apple and all Spotify and all of those podcasty things we're on yeah and so it's pretty straightforward which is quite unusual for me because all the other businesses and blogs I've started in the past were not that simple <laughs> and more complicated words so untold Italy is very easy to find so I look forward to connecting with people in the industry and you know fellow podcasters as well it's exciting thanks thank you Katie <laughs>